Hey, today we've got a really exciting show for you today with an interview from Hannah uh, from York Marrow Society. We've also got um, an interview with Bob from Mountaineering Society who recently climbed Mount Everest, which was really exciting. And also um, a behind the scenes look at um, Wildside, our, our, our new show, um, what the wild side um, and the filming that went on behind that. Hi, I'm Ben and welcome to the wild side. Today we're going to be interviewing Keeper Sophie and then we're going to have a look at some aquatic life. Let's get into it. Sophie, thank you for joining us today. I'm Ben. So, what do you like about being a zookeeper? Why do you want to do it? Every day is completely different. You don't know what you're walking into. Things change all the time. And as well, you can just never have a bad day spending it with cute animals. So, if things change all the time so much, have you got any interesting stories about anything funny that's happened, maybe gone wrong? Uh, we did clean out the Taupin tank in the ocean corridor, and because it was a bit dirty, are quite yeah. dirty animals and when we got them out put them in little boxes and then we went for lunch came back and a couple were missing oh, and they no. escaped into the aquatic room having a new did you manage to them. find them in the yeah, end yeah definitely found them but we did panic for a bit but got them all back <laughs> so do you like working with the terrapins in particular or is there any other animal that you're particularly interested in working with so my background is aquatics so i've worked in previous aquariums before coming here um, and at uni, I based all my assignments on aquatics. Uh, so definitely clownfish are my favourite species clownfish. of fish. Yes. So have you got any particular ones which you like? A certain clownfish which, say, has an interesting personality that you can see in it? So we've got a common clownfish here called Colin, which I named Colin the clownfish. And he has <laughs> definitely got a big personality. As soon as you go into the tank, he comes over, definitely has a look at what you're doing. Once he realises you're not fish food, he'll just run away. But he likes his little corner. He protects that, he likes it nice and dirty, so when, try, when you try and clean it, he's not happy. A nightmare to work with. <laughs> We're here with Ben today. Um, ben, you're the new presenter of The Wild Side, which is our new um, environment show. Do you want to talk a bit more about it, um, what it's about, what's, what we're learning? Yeah, so we spent a, a very fun day down in the uh, Ask and Brian Conservation uh, Centre. Amazing. And interviewing the conservation keepers and talking about their animals, got to see behind the scenes and just finding more about the work that they do there. Mm -hmm. um, and like, do you know what kind of conservation work they do at Ask and Brian, what is important, um, what kind of work they can do there and also maybe further afield? Yeah, so when we were going behind the scenes, they had a lot of endangered uh, species. There was one particular one which looked like a little crocodile mm -hmm. and they were critically endangered. So they have breeding programs and they accept um, uh, other endangered species from other conservation centres as a result of their breeding programmes, generally keeping the animals happy and healthy and bringing up the populations of those endangered ones. Amazing. And how big was it? Was it like inside, outside and different I mean, range of species? or anything? It was it was a good range. Uh, it just kept getting bigger. Yeah. With walking around, there were just new places everywhere. There were you know, lots of aquariums, they had lemurs, had birds, it was a very big variety of uh, animals there. Amazing, and did you have any particular favourites that you liked? Oh, I'm quite biased towards the alpacas because we get, did get to lead them around oh, wow. on a little walk with the crew as well. There's one alpaca called uh, Rolly who uh, I was leading around and he was uh, very well behaved and like some of the other ones. <laughs> Amazing. And um, what was it like filming down there? Did you enjoy it? Did you get oh, it was, any? It was brilliant. It was my first time I ever doing presenting. Uh -huh. And because it links in with my degree in biology, it was amazing getting to hear about all of the things you don't necessarily hear about when you're just visiting as a tourist. Mm -hmm. You get to see behind the scenes and a more in-depth of uh, appreciation of the place. Cool. And talk about behind the scenes. Did you get to go? Where? What kind of places did you get access to? So we got to go where they have the sort of aquatic animals which aren't on show. Okay. So they've got the display cases, but behind that they've got other uh, animals that they don't have out for various reasons. Amazing, well thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so next up we've actually got Bob from uh, Mountaineering Society. Hello. 
Hello. Hi, Rob. Nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. Now, are you on committee for Mountain Steering Society, or are I'm you? Not. I'm not. No. Um, and how often do you do? Do you do it? What made you want to join? Well, I've been doing mountain climbing and mountaineering in general for mm -hmm. over twelve years now. So, awesome. yeah, I've been a big part of my life. So, but you know, because I've never been, you know, I've never been to the UK before. So I thought, you know, it would be a great chance for me to like learn about you know mountains there. Yeah. Know. What do you think is when you're climbing? What's the kind of the best experience you've had? Uh, certainly the trip to Ken Goms, I believe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I went there a couple of weeks ago, and the weather was amazing. So that amazing. Was fun. And you last year, you said you climbed Everest, which is yes. an incredible <laughs> achievement. Yeah, um, what was the kind of training that you had to do to get that, and well, how did it feel? Um, it was actually a part of my ongoing project. So I'm currently doing something called the Seven Summits. Okay. So which is basically to climb um, the tallest mountain on every continent. Mm -hmm. So um, Everest was definitely part of it. So it was, I guess, part of my ongoing training, but. I guess it took around a year for me to like build up for my endurance and all that, but it was a very, certainly very tough expedition because it took um, around two to three months. We stayed in Nepal for around two months, climbed a couple of like 6,000 meter mountains mm -hmm. to sort of acclimate ourselves to the altitude. And after that, we, you know, went to base camp and climbed Mount Everest. So, wow. Yeah. Um, and how long did it kind of take you to do it? Uh, the actual summit push itself only took around a week to okay. get from base camp to top, but because we need to acclimatize, so mm -hmm. we basically spent close to a month in base camp, and you know, two months prior to that, we you know spent our time um, going to various like mountains in Nepal, climbing, you know, to yeah, just to acclimate ourselves to the altitude. Yeah. Amazing. Um, and then mountaineering itself, like, what is it that you enjoy about the sport? Is it uh, just the sense of achievement? I guess being knowing that you know you spend so much time doing this, and you know, ultimately reaching the top, or at least you know, even if you're not you know reaching the top, but you know the I guess the expedition itself, the you know the trail itself, it's very you know rewarding seeing all the nature stuff, and you know it's yeah. Brilliant. Um, and then for anyone interested in mountaineering, how do you reckon they could kind of get started? Or um, just pick a mountain to climb. It's, yeah. You know, it's you know I, I understand you know in the UK it's a bit harder because in Hong Kong we can just literally uh, you know hike a mountain like right next to our home or like right next to our school, so it's you know much more convenient in Hong Kong. But you know still, if you're into like hiking or if you want to get into hiking, you know just pick a mountain, just you know, take a weekend off to go, you know. Yeah. Oh, amazing. So, so we've seen a few photos. Um, is this um, from yes, this the is Everest summit? Everest. So that at the back there, that's, you know, the top of Mount Everest, basically. Wow. I'm standing on South Summit, which is actually the second tallest point on Earth. That's and incredible. it takes literally around an hour from, from the South Summit to the summit. So, yeah, it, the weather that day was amazing. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and so what are the kind of your future um, goals you want to achieve at other mountains? So, yeah, like I said, I've been attempting to finish the seven summits. So mm -hmm. right now I've only gone one left, which is the one in Antarctica. Wow. So um, hopefully, like I'm currently finding sponsors and all that, but hopefully if I can find enough sponsors and support, I will be able to go there by the end of this year. Amazing. So yeah. Um, it must be quite hard kind of to get actually get to Antarctica. Yeah, the, um, you know, the plane ride and all the logistics yeah. along that, that's the most difficult part actually, not to climb, because we need to sort out all the you know, transportation. Uh, I believe once we get to a place called Union Glacier in Antarctica, we need to arrange another separate transport to get to base camp, but you know, lots of logistics revolving around that. So. What do you kind of reckon would be your most important kit when you go mountaineering? Important? Um, kit, like piece of equipment? Um, I mean, for this, definitely oxygen. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> considering it's the tallest mountain on Earth, I mean, you can do it without oxygen, but typically, you know, for anyone who's, you know, climbing a 9,000 meter mountain for the first time, mm -hmm. definitely using oxygen. Um, uh, for, I don't know, for like snow in general, crampons, you know, uh, suitable boots, def yeah. definitely, yeah. You can see all the, obviously the ladder here. Yeah, that's the, uh, that? yeah, that's considered to be one of the most dangerous sections along the Everest climbing route. Mm -hmm. That's between um, Everest Base Camp and Base, uh, sorry, Camp 1, I believe. And so it took us around seven hours to get through this. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite, it's quite scary looking at this. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. So, well, thank yeah. you so much. That sounds really yeah. amazing and good thank luck. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so next, we've just got the wildlife back to the week. So, um, globally, um, the High Sea Oceans Treaty was finally reached at the United Nations on the 5th of March after years of planning. This treaty promises to protect the currently largely unregulated international waters, which cover around two thirds of the ocean. Current threats to this area include commercial fishing operations and plastic pollution. Some of the main objectives of the treaty are to regulate countries' access to marine genetic resources. See, um, upset global standards for environmental impact assessments on commercial activities in the ocean, manage conservation efforts and establish marine protected areas. Uh, so next up, we've got Hannah from um, York Marrow Society. Hi, Hannah. Hello. So um, York Marrow Society, what kind of things do you guys get involved in? 
um, and why um, is it important? So York Mara is the um, student branch of the national charity Anthony Nolan. Um, so our mission is to sign up as many people as possible to the um, stem cell register. Uh, so you've probably, well I hope, that you've seen us around campus mm -hmm. at some point this year doing donor recruitment events um, and also fundraising because obviously there's a cost to um, adding everybody to the register as well. Yeah. Um, yes. And why is it just like why is it so important to have as many stem cell donors as possible? Um, so if somebody's diagnosed with blood cancer, this could be like their last chance at life, um, and we need as many people on the stem cell register as possible so that um, there's a greater chance that when somebody needs those stem cells, they'll be able to find a match um, so somebody who can donate. And we're especially um, we need to increase the amount of men on the stem cell register because there there's quite a low percentage um, of those. And they are really good donors, young men, especially student age. Um, and also we're trying to diversify the stem cell register at the moment. Um, yes. That's amazing. Um, so if you want to join a stem cell register, how do you go about that? Um, so you can find, um, you can do it online and it's really easy. Um, if you just search Anthony Nolan, join the stem cell register, or if you go on York Marrow's Instagram, there'll be a link in the bio. Um, and you just fill in a 10 minute form and um, they will send swabs to your house you do the swabs, put them in the post for free, and that is it. And you might never hear anything about this, um, because if you sign up, there's only a one in a hundred chance that you'd actually go on to donate your stem cells. Okay. Um, but that could those that quick cheek swab could be, you know, could save somebody's life in the long run if you were matched with them and then went on to donate your stem cells. Amazing. And then anyone interested in joining society, how can they kind of go about that? Um, connect with us on Instagram, Facebook. Um, we have a big volunteer um, body. We'll be running more events next term. And definitely, if this sounds interesting, I would recommend getting involved in the society. We also do like social events for the volunteers um, and with other Mara groups from other universities as well. So it's definitely a really good thing to be involved in. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. Um, so what kind of like you fundraising activities you get involved in? Yeah, um, recently we did um, a Valentine's bake sale outside of the library. Um, We've also done, like, so we co collaborated with some other societies and um, putting, like, glitter on people's faces before they went on a night out. And that is quite fun for us. And that managed to raise a lot of money for um, the charity as well. Amazing. Um, and then you're uh, president of the York Maori Society. I am now, yes. How is that? Um, is it a lot of work or is it like you just, um, is it a lot of fundraising or um, organising events, what kind of things do you get um, involved yeah, in? Yeah, we do a lot of organising events um, and recently we went to the National Marrow Conference um, with all the other Marrow groups um, here and, you know, kind of what the, the National Marrow Group runs like campaigns, so like this is March for Men and we're supposed to be running campaigns to sign up more men to the Stem Cell Register specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just organising a lot of donor recruitment events. Hope I really hope that you've seen us around campus. Um, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, if you any, any other things you want to share, like important messages maybe for anyone watching? Um, if this is something that you're interested in, it will take like 10 minutes of your time to sign up to the Stem Cell Register. It is um, really easy and it's just a quick sweet cheek swab and then, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we're going to finish off then um, with our wildlife fact of the week. Um, so dragonflies actually have the strongest wings out of any insects. They can fly up to 30 miles an hour for long periods of time. Uh, they also have excellent eyesight and can actually see in all directions at the same time. Dragonflies use these two abilities to hunt and eat small insects, tadpoles and um, small fish as well. Um, so uh, thank you so much for watching our uh, episode 4 of Planet A today. Um, we've got We Are Society coming up next on um, YSTV.